PBS Hollywood Presents was made possible by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance public understanding of science and technology. The foundation also seeks to portray the lives of men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit. The Amundsen Foundation, committed to the creative pursuit of quality in the arts. Michael J. Connell Foundation, Lovelace Family Trust, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. Copenhagen will begin after this brief introduction. A lot of people think the play is about moral questions, about whether scientists should work on uh, weapons. But of course, moral questions do come into it. Before we can make any moral judgments of anyone, we have to understand why they're doing what they do. Um, you can't make a moral judgment about anyone unless you have some knowledge of their intentions. My play Copenhagen is based on a real event and a real mystery. It's about a meeting between two great scientists during the Second World War in Nazi-occupied Denmark. Werner Heisenberg, the German physicist, and Niels Bohr, the Danish physicist. Now, the two men had been close friends and colleagues for over 20 years. They had pioneered the field of atomic physics, and eventually their work would lead to the development of the first atomic bomb. And the problem was that at the time of the meeting in Copenhagen, they were on opposite sides in the war. So the meeting was fraught with difficulty from the beginning. And ever since then, people have argued about what it was the two men said to each other at the meeting and what it was that Heisenberg wanted to say. They were two of the greatest physicists of the 20th century because they had begun to establish what happens inside the tiny world of the atom. When they first met at the beginning of the 20s, Niels Bohr was already extremely famous. He was a great physicist who had won the Nobel Prize for his work. And Heisenberg was a young man at the very beginning of his career, a very cheeky and brilliant young student. And they did a lot of their very best work together. They had taken the lead in developing quantum mechanics, possibly the most important and successful theory ever to be introduced into physics. It was a match made in heaven, with Bohr pioneering the physical picture that he could see in his mind's eye, and Heisenberg, the mathematician, the, the person who could then put into concrete mathematical language the dance of atoms, the dance of electrons that Bohr could only dream about. And that's where Niels Bohr and Heisenberg worked so well. Heisenberg's famous uncertainty principle that he introduced into quantum mechanics in the 1920s um, demonstrates that we can never have total knowledge of the behavior of physical object. It only matters when we're talking about very fast moving ones like particles, but in theory it applies to everything. And if we can't know everything about a physical object, we can't make predictions about it. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle challenges our normal understanding of the world. We physicists go crazy when we think about the uncertainty principle. Some people think that physics is a, is a finished question. We, we know everything, given enough information. You know where objects are. You know how they're going to perform. You can predict the outcomes of things. So it's really upsetting. It's really upsetting to some people at a very deep fundamental level that we physicists really don't know where things really are at any given time. That ultimately there is this uncertainty that goes to the very heart of reality itself. Heisenberg was still only 33 when he won the Nobel Prize for the uncertainty principle. But it was also the year in which um, Hitler came to power. 
Heisenberg could have left Germany. He was offered jobs in various American universities. Heisenberg has been much criticized because he didn't go. Absolutely no one thinks Heisenberg was a Nazi or a Nazi sympathizer. The criticism that's made of him is that he acquiesced, that he was uh, too prepared to compromise with the Nazi regime. The advent of Hitler began to place a great strain on the friendship between the two men. Then there was a discovery in the field of atomic physics, which changed everything. In the 1930s, it was demonstrated that if you fissioned the nucleus, if you split the nucleus of an atom, it released energy. It suddenly seemed theoretically possible to use atomic physics to produce power for either constructive or destructive purposes. This was the moment when atomic physics ceased to be purely abstract and took on an immense significance for the future of the human race. Niels Bohr, because he liked to think in terms of physical pictures, had the idea that the nucleus of the atom was like a droplet of water, where surface tension kept the, the droplet of water intact and spherical. However, if you came in and hit it with an outside object, this liquid drop could then fission in half into two smaller liquid drops. And then he realized that perhaps you could release fantastic amounts of energy, the energy that was known to be stored in the nucleus of the atom by splitting it with this liquid drop. And then he very rapidly calculated that you had to have an exotic form of uranium, U-235. Then began an international chase to see who could get this fabulous U-235, this rare form of uranium. What was at stake was the fate of humanity itself. Bohr and Heisenberg were the leaders in a kind of physics that could now be used to produce, in theory, a most terrible weapon. But they were cut off from each other. When the war broke out in 1939, Heisenberg knew that that was the end of his contact with Bohr in Copenhagen. And he wrote a very moving letter to Bohr, which goes right to the heart of the father-son relationship they had. Dear Bohr, since I don't know whether and when our destiny will lead us together again, I will once again thank you for all your friendship, for everything I have learned from you, and for everything you have done for me. In old friendship, yours, Werner Heisenberg. In 1941, the two men had been out of contact for two years. The boy had been living uh, precariously because he was half Jewish under Nazi occupation. And what he didn't know was that his old friend Heisenberg was now running the German atomic research program. enormous difficulty, Heisenberg managed to go to Copenhagen. And he was very insistent on a personal meeting with Bohr. According to Heisenberg, they began some kind of conversation. Um, Niels Bohr became upset and then angry, and the conversation was broken off, according to Heisenberg, before he could explain what it was he wanted to say. And people have been arguing ever since about two things, what it was they did actually manage to say to each other and what it was Heisenberg wanted to go on to say. I thought the meeting suggested a very good parallel between Heisenberg's uncertainty principle and the um, psychological uncertainty that I think exists, the theoretical barrier in knowing why people do what they do. And the particular difficulty of knowing why Heisenberg went to Copenhagen seemed to focus the difficulty in one particular incident. And what the play is about is whether we can really have any absolute knowledge of anyone's intentions.
And now PBS Hollywood presents Copenhagen. matter, my love, now that we're all three of us dead and gone? Some questions remain long after their owners have died. Some questions have no answers to find. Why did he come? What was he trying to tell you? He did explain later. He explained over and over again. Each time he explained, it became more obscure. It was probably very simple when you come right down to it. He wanted to have a talk. A talk? To the enemy in the middle of a war. My grief and my love, we were scarcely the enemy. It was 1941. Heisenberg was one of our oldest friends. Heisenberg was German. We were Danes. We were under German occupation. It put us in a difficult position, certainly. I've never seen you as angry with anyone as you were with Heisenberg that night. Not to disagree, but I believe I remained remarkably calm. I know when you're angry. It was as difficult for him as it was for us. So why did he do it? I doubt if he ever really knew himself. And he wasn't a friend. Not after that visit. That was the end of the famous friendship between Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg. Now we're all dead and gone, yes. And there are only two things the world remembers about me. One is the uncertainty principle. The other is my mysterious visit to Niels Bohr in Copenhagen in 1941. Everyone understands uncertainty, or thinks he does. No one understands my trip to Copenhagen. Time and time again I've explained it. To bore himself and Margrethe. To interrogators and intelligence officers, to journalists and historians. The more I've explained, the deeper the uncertainty has become. Well, I shall be happy to make one more attempt. Now we're all dead and gone. Now no one can be hurt. Now no one can be betrayed. Never entirely liked him, you know. Perhaps I can say that to you now. Yes, you did. When he was first here in the 20s, of course you did. On the beach at Tisvilda with us and the boys. He was one of the family. There was something alien about him even then. Well, he was a very great physicist. I never changed my mind about that. Well, they were all good, all the people who came to Copenhagen to work with you. With most of the great pioneers in atomic theory here at one time or another. The more I look back on it, the more I think Heisenberg was the greatest of them all. So what was Paul? He was the first of us all, the father of us all. Modern atomic physics began when Bohr realized that quantum theory applied to matter as well as to energy, 1913. Everything we did was based on that great insight of his. I mean, you think that he first came here to work with me in 1924, and in just over a year, he'd invented quantum mechanics. 
him out of his work with you? Mostly out of what he'd been doing with Max Bourne and Pasquale Jordan and Göttingen. Another year or so, and he got uncertainty. And you'd done complementarity? We argued them both out together. We did most of our best work together. And we went on working together long after he ceased to be my assistant. Long after I'd left Copenhagen in 1927 and gone back to Germany. came to power. Then the war broke out and it became more and more difficult. Until that day in 1941. When it finished forever. Yes. Why did he do it? September 1941, Copenhagen. And at once, here I am, getting off the night train from Berlin. A plain civilian suit and a raincoat among all the field grey Wehrmacht uniforms arriving with us. All the naval gold braid, all the well-tailored black of the SS. He wants to see you? I assume that's why he's come. You're not really thinking of inviting him to the house. That's obviously what he's hoping. Niels, they've occupied our country. He is not they. He is one of them. First of all, there's an official visit to Bohr's workplace, the Institute for Theoretical Physics. No doubt an awkward lunch in the old familiar canteen. The lunch was a disaster. He made a very bad impression. Occupation of Denmark, unfortunate. Occupation of Poland, however, perfectly acceptable. Germany now certain to win the war. Our tanks are almost at Moscow. What can stop us? Well, one thing, perhaps. One thing. He knows he's being watched, of course. One must remember that. He has to be careful about what he says. Or he won't be allowed to travel abroad again. My love, the Gestapo planted microphones in his house. He told Gutschmidt when he was in America. The SS brought him in for interrogation. And then they let him go again. Still think of him as a boy. He's nearly 40. A middle-aged professor, fast catching up with the rest of us. You still want to invite him here? Let's add up the arguments, you know reasonably scientific way. Firstly, Heisenberg is a friend. Firstly, Heisenberg is a German. A white Jew. That's what the Nazis called him. He taught relativity, and they said it was Jewish physics. He couldn't mention Einstein by name, but he stuck with relativity in spite of the most terrible attacks. All the real Jews have lost their jobs. He's still teaching. He's still teaching relativity. Wouldn't leave Germany. He wants to be there to rebuild German science when Hitler goes. And if he is being watched, it'll all be reported upon. Who he sees, what he says to them, and what they say to him. I carry my surveillance around like an infectious disease. But then I happen to know that Bohr is also under surveillance. You know you're being watched yourself. By the Gestapo, I have nothing to hide. By our fellow Danes. It would be the most terrible betrayal of all their trust in you if they thought you were collaborating. Inviting an old friend to dinner is hardly collaborating. Might appear to be collaborating. Yes. He's put us in a difficult position. I shall never forgive him. He must have good reason. 
You must have very good reason. You won't talk about politics. We'll stick to physics. I assume it's physics he wants to talk to me about. I think you must also assume that you and I aren't the only two people who hear what's being said in this house. If you want to speak privately, you better go out into the open air. I shan't want to speak privately. You could go for another of your walks together. I don't think we'll be going for any walks. Whatever he has to say, he can say where everyone can hear it. Some new idea he wants to try out on you, perhaps? What can it be, though? Where are we off to next? So now, of course, your curiosity is aroused, in spite of everything. So now here I am, walking out through the autumn light to the Boar's house at Nikarlsberg, followed, presumably, by my invisible shadow. What am I feeling? Fear, certainly. The touch of fear that one always feels for a teacher, for an employer, for a parent. Much worse fear about what I have to say, about how to express it, how to broach it in the first place. Worse fear still about what happens if I fail. It's not something to do with the war. Heisenberg is a theoretical physicist. I don't think anyone has yet discovered a way you can use theoretical physics to kill people. Couldn't be something about fission? Fission? Why would he want to talk to me about fission? Oh, because you're working on it. Heisenberg isn't. Isn't he? Everybody else in the world seems to be, and you're the acknowledged authority. He hasn't published on fission. It was Heisenberg who did all the original work on the physics of the nucleus. He consulted you then, consulted you at every step. That was back in 1932. Fission's only been around for the last three years. But if the Germans were developing some kind of weapon based on nuclear fission... My love, no one is going to develop a weapon based on nuclear fission. But if they were trying to, then Heisenberg would be involved. There's no shortage of good German physicists. Oh, there's no shortage of good German physicists in America and Britain. The Jews have gone, obviously. So Heisenberg would be in charge of the work? Margareta, there is no work. There's no way in the foreseeable future in which fission can be used to produce any kind of weapon. Then why is everyone still working on it? Because there's an element of magic in it. You fire a neutron at the nucleus of a uranium atom and it splits into two different elements. It's what the alchemists were trying to do, to turn one element into another. So why is he coming? I crunch over the familiar gravel to the boar's front door and tug at the familiar bell pull. What am I feeling? Fear, yes, and another sensation has become painfully familiar over the past year. A mixture of self-importance and sheer helpless absurdity that of all the 2,000 million people in this world, I'm the one who's been charged with the impossible responsibility. My dear Heisenberg. My dear Ball. Come in. And of course, as soon as they catch sight of each other, all their caution disappears. The old flames leap up from the ashes. If we can just negotiate all the treacherous little opening civilities. I'm so touched you for able to ask me. We must try to go on behaving like human beings. I do realize how awkward this is. We scarcely have a chance to do more than shake hands at lunch. Margaret, I haven't seen since. You were here four years ago. Niels is right. You look older. I had been hoping to see you both in 1938 at the Congress in Warsaw. I believe you had some personal trouble. Little business in Berlin. And the Prince Albertstrasse with the SS? Slight misunderstanding. We had, yes. I'm so sorry. These things happen. The question is now resolved. 
happily resolved. We should have all met in Zurich. In September 1939. Only, of course. There was an unfortunate clash with the outbreak of war. Sadly. Sadly for us, certainly. A lot more sadly still for many people. Yes, indeed. Well, there it is. What can I say? What can any of us say in the present circumstances? No. And your sons, there? Are well, thank you. Elizabeth, the children? Oh, very well. They, they send their love, of course. They so much wanted to see each other in spite of everything. But now the moment has come, they're so busy avoiding each other's eye that they can scarcely see each other at all. I wonder if you realize quite how much it means to me to be back here in Copenhagen, in this house. I've been rather isolated over these past few years. I can imagine. Me, he scarcely notices. I watch him discreetly from behind my expression of polite interest as he struggles on. Have things here been difficult? Difficult? Of course, he has to ask. He has to get it out of the way. Difficult, what can I say? We've not so far been treated to the gross abuses that have occurred elsewhere. The race laws have not been enforced. Yet. A few months ago, they started deporting communists and other anti-German elements. But you personally... I've been left strictly alone. I've been anxious about you. Kind of you. No call for sleepless nights in Leipzig so far, though. Another silence. He's done his duty. Now he can begin to steer the conversation round to pleasanter subjects. Are you still sailing? Sailing? Not a good start. No, no sailing. The sound is... Mind. Of course. I assume he won't ask Niels if he's been skiing? You've managed to get some skiing. Skiing? In Denmark? Norway. You used to go to Norway. I did, yes. But since Norway is also... Well... Also occupied. Yes, that might make it easier. In fact, I suppose we could now holiday almost anywhere in Europe. I'm sorry. I, I hadn't thought of it quite in those terms. I... Perhaps I'm being a little oversensitive. Of course not. N no, I should have thought. He must almost be starting to wish he was back in the Prince Albertstrasse with the SS. I don't suppose you feel he could ever come to Germany. The boy is an idiot. My dear Heisenberg, it would be an easy mistake to make to think that the citizens of a small nation, a small nation overrun, wantonly and cruelly overrun, by its more powerful neighbor, don't have exactly the same feelings of national pride as their conquerors. Exactly the same love of their country. Niels, we agreed. To talk about physics, yes. Not about politics. I'm sorry. No, no, I, I was simply going to say that I still have my old ski hut in Bayer Shell. So, if by any chance, at any time, for any reason, you... Perhaps Margrethe would be kind enough to sew a yellow star on my ski jacket. Yes. Yes, stupid of me. Just... Those first brief sparks have disappeared, and the ashes have become very cold indeed. So now, of course, I'm starting to feel almost sorry for him. He looks younger again, like the boy who first came here in 1924. Younger than Christian would have been now, shy and arrogant and anxious to be loved. Homesick, 
and pleased to be away from home at last. And yes, it's sad because Niels loved him. He was like a father to him. So, what are you working on? Fission, mostly. And you? Various things. Fission? Sometimes very envious of your cyclotron. Why? Are you working on fission yourself? There are over 30 in the United States. Whereas in the whole of Germany, the... well, whereas in Germany, you were saying there is not one single cyclotron. You haven't come to borrow the cyclotron, have you? That's not why you've come to Copenhagen. No. That's not why I've come to Copenhagen. I'm sorry, we mustn't jump to conclusions. No. We must, none of us, jump to conclusions of any sort. We must wait patiently to be told. It's not always easy to explain things to the world at large. I realize we must always be conscious of the wider audience our words may have, but the lack of cyclotrons in Germany is surely not a military secret. I have no idea what's the secret and what isn't. No secret either about why there aren't any. You can't say it, but I can. It's because the Nazis have systematically undermined theoretical physics. Why? Because so many people working in the field were Jews. Physics, yes, physics. This is physics. But also politics. The two are sometimes painfully difficult to keep apart. Are you in touch with any of our friends in England? Born, Chadwick. Heisenberg. We're under German occupation. Germany's at war with Britain. I thought you might have contacts of some sort. And people in America. We're not at war with America. Yet. You've not heard from Powley and Princeton, Goodsmith, Fell. What do you want to know? I was simply curious. We both have good friends in the German embassy here who are quite old fashioned in the way they use their influence. They would certainly be trying to see the distinguished local citizens were able to work undisturbed. Are you telling me that I'm being protected by your friends in the embassy? What I'm saying is that. You might find congenial company there. I know people who would feel very honored if you were able to accept the occasional invitation. To cocktail parties in the German embassy. Coffee and cakes with the Nazi plenipotentiary. Lectures, perhaps. Discussion groups. Social contacts of any sort could be Helpful. I'm sure they could. Essential, perhaps, in certain circumstances. In what circumstances? I think we both know. Because I'm half Jewish. We all, at one time or another, may need the help of our friends. Is this why you've come to Copenhagen? To invite me to watch the deportation of my fellow Danes from a grandstand seat in the windows of the German embassy? Oh, please, please. What else can I do? How else can I help? It's an impossibly difficult situation for you. I understand that. It's also an impossibly difficult situation for me. I'm sure you have the best of intentions. Get what I said. Unless... Unless I need to remember it. 
In any case, that's, uh, that's not why I've come. Do you remember where we first met? Of course. Göttingen in 1922. The lecture festival held in your honor. It was a high honor. I was very conscious of it. You were being honored for two reasons. Firstly, because you were a great physicist. Yes. And secondly, because you were one of the few people in Europe who was prepared to have dealings with Germany. The war had been over for four years. We were still lepers. You held out your hand to us. You bit it. Bit it? Bit my hand, you did. I held it out in my most statesmanlike and reconciliatory way, and you gave it a very nasty nip. I did. First time I ever set eyes on you. One of those lectures I was giving in Göttingen. What are you talking about? You stood up and laid into me. I, I offered a few comments. At Beautiful summer's day. Scent of roses drifting in from the gardens. Rows of eminent physicists and mathematicians all nodding approval of my benevolence and wisdom. Suddenly up jumps a cheeky young pup and tells me my mathematics are wrong. They were wrong. How old were you? Twenty. <laughs> <laughs> Niels has suddenly decided to love him again, in spite of everything. Why? What happened? Was it the recollection of that summer's day in Göttingen? Or everything? Or nothing at all? Whatever it was, by the time we've sat down to dinner, the cold ashes have started into flame once again. You were always so combative. It was the same when we played table tennis at Tis Villa. You look as if you were trying to kill me. Well, I wanted to win. Of course I wanted to win. You wanted to win. I wanted an agreeable game of table tennis. You couldn't see the expression on your face. I could see the expression in yours. What about those games of poker, then? At the ski hut by the cell? You once cleaned us out, you remember that? With a non-existent straight. <laughs> we're, we're all mathematicians. We're all counting cards. We're all 90% certain he hasn't got anything. But on he goes. Raising us and raising us, this insane confidence, till our faith in mathematical probability begins to waver, and one by one, we all throw in. I thought I had a straight. I misread the cards. I bluffed myself. <laughs> Poor Niels. Poor Niels? <laughs> he won. He bankrupted us. You were insanely competitive. At Byrus Cell, we'd ski down from the hut to get provisions, and he'd make even that into some kind of race. Do you remember when we were there with Weizsäcker and someone? You got out a stopwatch. Mm, took Paul Weizsäcker 18 minutes. You were down there in 10, of course. Eight. I don't recall how long I took. 45. Thank you. Some rather swift skiing going on here, I think. And your skiing is like your science. I mean, what were you waiting for? Me and Weizsäcker to come back and give you a, a slight change of emphasis. Probably. You were doing 17 drafts of each slalom. At least I knew where I was. Oh. At the speed you were going, you were up against the uncertainty relationship. If you knew where you were when you were down, you didn't know how fast you'd got there. If you knew how fast you'd been going, you didn't know you were down. The faster you ski, the sooner you're over the cracks and crevices. The faster you ski, the better you think. Uh, not to disagree, but that is most, most interesting. But... <laughs> By which he means it's nonsense. But it's not nonsense. Uh, decisions make themselves when you're coming downhill at 70 kilometers an hour. Suddenly, there is the edge of nothingness. Swerve left or swerve right. Or think about it and die. <laughs> to talk to each other about everything. Your work, your problems, me, no doubt. I was formed by nature to be a mathematically curious entity. Not one, but half of two. Mathematics becomes very odd 
when you apply it to people. One and one can add up to so many different sums. Silence. And of course, they're thinking about their children again. Silence. What's he thinking about now? His life? Or ours? So many things we think about at the same time. Our lives and our physics. All the things that come into our heads out of nowhere. Our private consolations. Our private agonies. The same bright things. The same dark things. Back and back they come. Their four children living, and their two children dead. Harold, lying alone in that ward. She's thinking about Christian and Harold. The two lost boys. Harold. All those years alone in that terrible ward. And Christian, the firstborn, the eldest son. And once again, I see those same few moments that I see every day. Those short moments on the boat, when the teller slams over in the heavy sea, and Christian is falling. If I hadn't let him take the helm. Those long moments in the water. Those endless moments in the water. About some things even we only think. Because there's nothing to be said. You suggested a stroll. We shan't be long. A week at most. What? Our great hike through Zealand. We went to Elsinore. I often think about what you said there. You don't mind, my love, half an hour. An hour, perhaps. <laughs> no, the whole appearance of Elsinore, you said, was changed by knowing that Hamlet had lived there. Every dark corner there reminds us of the darkness inside the human soul. So they're walking again. He's done it. And if they're walking, they're talking. Talking in a rather different way, no doubt. I knew Niels would never hold out if they could just get through the first few minutes. If only out of curiosity. Now they're started. An hour will mean two, of course, perhaps three. First thing they ever did was to go for a walk together. In Göttingen, after that lecture, Niels immediately went to look for the presumptuous young man who'd queried his mathematics and swept him off for a tramp in the country. Walk, talk, make his acquaintance. And when Heisenberg arrived here to work for him, off they go again on their great tour of Zealand. A lot of this century's physics they did in the open air. Strolling around the forest paths at Tisvile. Going down to the beach with the children. Heisenberg holding Christian's hand. Yes. And every evening in Copenhagen after dinner, they'd walk around Fellel Park. Walk. And talk. But this time... Say goodbye, he's leaving. Thank you for a delightful evening. Almost like old times. Most kind of you. You'll have some coffee, a, a, a glass or something? I must prepare for my lecture. But you'll come and see us again before you leave. He has a great deal to do. Forgive me if I've done or said anything. Yes, yes. Perhaps when this war is over, if we're all spared. 
Goodbye. Politics? Physics. What did he say? Nothing. I don't know. I was too angry to take it in. Something about fishing? But what exactly had Heisenberg said? That's what everyone wanted to know. Then and forever after. That's what the British wanted to know as soon as Chadwick managed to get in touch with me. What exactly did Heisenberg say? And what exactly did Bohr reply? That was, of course, the first thing my colleagues asked me when I got back to Germany. What did Heisenberg tell you? What did you reply? The one person who wanted to know was Heisenberg himself. You mean when he came back to Copenhagen after the war in 1947? I think he wanted various things. Two things. Food parcels. For his family in Germany, they were on the verge of starvation. And for you to agree on what you'd said to each other in 1941. The conversation went wrong almost as fast as it did before. You couldn't even agree where you'd walked that night. Where we walked? Fellow Park, of course. Where we went so often in the old days. No, 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 not Fellow Park. That's behind the Institute. Four kilometres away from where we lived. But I can see the street lamps next to the bandstand. It was 1941. No street lamps. I thought we hadn't got any further than my study. I can see the drift of papers under the reading lamp on my desk. I well, must have been outside. What I was going to say was treasonable. If I'd been overheard, I would have been executed. So what was this mysterious thing you said? There's no mystery about it. There, there never was any mystery. I remember it absolutely clearly, because my life was at stake, and I chose my words very carefully. Does one, as a physicist, have the moral right to work on the practical exploitation of atomic energy? The implication was obvious that you were working on it. And you jumped to the conclusion that I was trying to provide Hitler with nuclear weapons. And you were. No! A reactor! That's what we were trying to build, a machine to produce power, to generate electricity, to drive ships. But then I asked you, do you actually think uranium fission can be used for the construction of weapons? I now know that it can be. This is what really horrified me. What happens in fission? You fire a neutron at a uranium nucleus, it splits and it releases energy. A huge amount of energy, yes. About enough to move a speck of dust. But it also releases two or three more neutrons, each of which has the chance of splitting another nucleus. So then those two or three split nuclei each release energy in their turn. And two or three more neutrons. You start a trickle of snow sliding as you ski, the trickle becomes a snowball. An ever-widening chain of split nuclei forks through the uranium, doubling and quadrupling in millions of a second from one generation to the next. The thunder of the gathering avalanche echoes from all the surrounding mountains. Until eventually, after, let's say, 80 generations, 280 specks of dust have been moved. Enough specks of dust to constitute a city and all who live in it. But there is a catch. There is a catch, thank God. Natural uranium consists of two different isotopes, U238 and U235. Less than 1% of it is U235. And this tiny fraction is the only part of it that's fissionable by fast neutrons. What we'd realize, though, 
that if we could once get the reactor going... The 238 in the natural uranium would absorb the fast neutrons and be transformed by them into a new element altogether. Plutonium. Plutonium. If we could build a reactor, we could build bombs. That's what had brought me to Copenhagen. But none of this could I say, and at this point, you'd stop listening. The bomb had already gone off inside your head. Because I'd grasped the central point already, that one way or another you saw the possibility of supplying Hitler with nuclear weapons. You grasped at least four different central points, all of them wrong. You told Rosenthal that I'd tried to pick your brains on fission. You told Weisskopf that I'd asked you what you knew about the Allied nuclear program. Chadwick thought I was hoping to persuade you that there was no German program, but then it seems you told some people that I'd tried to recruit you to work on it. Very well, let's start all over again from the beginning. No Gestapo in the shadows this time, no British intelligence officer, no one watching us at all. Only me. Only Margrethe. We're going to make the whole thing clear to Margrethe. You know how strongly I believe that we don't do science for ourselves, that we do it so we can explain to others... In plain language. In plain language. Not your view, I know. You'd be happy to describe what you were up to purely in differential equations, if you could. But for Margrethe's sake... In plain language. Plain language. All right, so here we are, walking along once more, and this time I'm absolutely calm. I'm listening intently. What is it you want to say? It's not just what I want to say. The whole German nuclear team in Berlin, they all wanted me to come and discuss it with you. Go back to Germany, Heisenberg. Gather your colleagues together in the laboratory. Get up on a table and tell them what. Niels Bohr says that in his considered judgment, supplying a homicidal maniac with an improved instrument of mass murder is, what shall I say, an interesting idea. No, not even an interesting idea. A really rather seriously uninteresting idea. What happens? You all fling down your Geiger counters? Obviously not. Because they'll arrest you. My one hope is to remain in control. So you don't want me to say yes, and you don't want me to say no? What I want is for you to listen very carefully to what I'm going to say next. Very well, here I am, listening most carefully as you tell me... ...that nuclear weapons will require an enormous technical effort. True. Sure that they will suck up huge resources. Huge resources, certainly. That sooner or later, governments will have to turn to scientists and ask them whether it's worth committing those resources, whether there is any hope of producing the weapons in time for them to be used. Wait, so they will have to turn to you and me. We are the ones who will have to advise them whether to go ahead or not. In the end, the decision will be in our hands, whether we like it or not. And that's what you want to tell me? That's what I want to tell you. That's why you've come all this way with so much difficulty. That's why you've thrown away nearly 20 years of friendship. Simply to tell me that. Simply to tell you that. But Eisenberg, this is more mysterious than ever. What are you telling me it for? What am I supposed to do about it? The government of occupied Denmark isn't going to come to me and ask me whether we should produce nuclear weapons. No, but sooner or later, if I manage to stay in control of our program, the German government is going to come to me. They are going to ask me whether to continue or not. I will have to decide what to tell them. Then you have an easy way out of your difficulties. You tell them the same truth that you've just told me. You tell them how difficult it will be. And perhaps they'll be discouraged, perhaps they'll lose interest. There was a report in a Stockholm newspaper that the Americans are working on an atomic bomb.
Ah. Oh. Now it comes. Now it comes. Now I understand everything. You think I have contacts with the Americans? Oh, you may. It's just conceivable. If anybody in occupied Europe does, it will be you. So you do want to know about the Allied nuclear program? I simply want to know if there is one. Some, some hint, some clue. I've, I've just betrayed my country and risked my life to warn you of the German program. And now I'm supposed to return the compliment. Bohr, I have to know. I'm the one who has to decide. If the Allies are building a bomb, what am I choosing for my country? Germany is where I was born. Germany is where I became what I am. Germany is all the faces of my childhood, all the, the hands that picked me up when I fell, all the, the voices that encouraged me, that set me on my way, all the hearts that speak to my heart. Germany is my widowed mother, my impossible brother, my wife. Germany is our children. I have to know what I'm deciding for them. Another defeat? Another nightmare like the nightmare I grew up with? Boar. My childhood ended in anarchy and civil war. Are more children going to starve as we did? But, my dear Heisenberg, there's nothing I can tell you. I've no idea whether there's an allied nuclear program. But that allied nuclear program is just getting underway even as we're talking. And the bomb they're building is to be used on us. On the evening of Hiroshima, Oppenheimer said it was his one regret that they hadn't produced the bomb in time to use on Germany. He tormented himself afterwards. Afterwards, yes. At least we tormented ourselves a little beforehand. Did a single one of them stop to think, even for a brief moment, about what they were doing? Did you, when you went to Los Alamos? My dear good Heisenberg, we weren't supplying the bomb to Hitler. You weren't dropping it on Hitler, either. You were dropping it on anyone within reach, on old men and women in the street, on mothers and their children. And if you produced it in time, they would have been my fellow countrymen, my wife, my children. That was the intention, yes? That was the intention. You never had the slightest conception of what happens when bombs are dropped on cities, even conventional bombs. None of you ever experienced it. You know why Allied scientists worked on the bomb. Of course, fear. The same fear that consumed you. Because they were afraid that you were working on it. But, boy, you could have told them. Told them what? What I told you in 1941. That the choice is in our hands, mine and Oppenheimer's. That if I can tell them the simple truth when they ask me, the simple, discouraging truth, so can he. This is what you wanted from me? Not to tell you what the Americans were doing, but to stop them? To tell them we can stop it together. I had no contact with the Americans. He did with the British. Only later. The Gestapo intercepted the message you sent them about our meeting. And passed it to you? Well, why not? They began to trust me. That's what gave me the opportunity of remaining in control of events. Uh, not to criticize. Heisenberg, but if this was your plan in coming to Copenhagen, it's, what can I say, it's most interesting. It wasn't a plan, it was a hope, not even a hope, a microscopically fine thread of possibility, a wild improbability. Worth trying, though, Bohr. Worth trying, surely. But already you were too angry to understand what I was saying. No, no. Why he was angry was because he was beginning to understand. The Germans drive out most of their best physicists because they're Jews. America and Britain give them sanctuary. And now it seems that this might offer the Allies a hope of salvation. And at once you came howling here to Niels, begging him to persuade them to give it up. Margrethe, my love, perhaps we should express ourselves a little more temperately. But the gall of it, the sheer breathtaking gall of it. Bold skiing, I have to say. But, Bohr, we weren't skiing then. I refused to believe it when I first heard the news of Hiroshima. I thought it was just one of those strange dr dreams we were living in at the time, but, but... 
You've done it. You'd built the bomb. Yes. And you'd used it on a living target. On a living target. You're not suggesting that Niels did anything wrong by working at Los Alamos? Of course not. The decision had been taken long before Niels arrived. The bomb would have been built whether he'd gone or not. In any case, my part was very small. Oppenheimer described you as the team's father confessor. It seemed to be my role in life. He said you made a great contribution. Spiritual, possibly, not practical. Fermi said it was you who worked out how to trigger the Nagasaki bomb. I put forward an idea. You're not implying that there's anything that Niels needs to explain or defend? No one has ever expected him to explain or defend anything. He is a profoundly good man. It's not a question of goodness. I was spared the decision. Yes, and I was not. So explaining and defending myself was how I spent the last 30 years of my life. When I went to America in 1949, a lot of the physicists wouldn't even shake my hand. Hands that had actually built the bomb wouldn't touch mine. Let me tell you, if you think you're making yourself any clearer to me now, you're not. Margareta, I understand his feelings. I don't. I'm as angry as you were before. It's so easy to make you feel conscience-stricken. Why should he transfer his burden to you? Because what does he do after his great consultation with you? He goes back to Berlin and tells the Nazis that he can produce atomic bombs. But what I stress is the difficulty in separating 235. You tell them about plutonium. I tell some of the minor officials. I have to keep people's hopes alive. And you ask Albert Speer for the funding to continue? To continue with the reactor? Of course I do. But I ask him for so little that he doesn't take the program seriously. Do you tell him the reactor will produce plutonium? I don't tell him the reactor will produce plutonium, not Spear, no. I don't tell him the reactor will produce plutonium. A striking omission, I have to admit. And what happens? It works. He gives us barely enough money to keep the reactor program ticking over. And that is the end of the German atomic bomb. That is the end of it. You go on with the reactor, though. We go on with the reactor, of course, because now there's no risk of getting it running in time to produce enough plutonium for a bomb. No, we go on with the reactor, all right. I keep that program going. I keep it under my control till the bitter end. Everything was still under your control? Under my control, yes, that's the point. Under my control. Nothing was under anyone's control by that time. Perrin examined it after the Allied troops took over. They said it had no cadmium control rods. There was nothing to absorb any excess of neutrons to slow down the reaction when it overheated. You were no longer running that program, Heisenberg. The program was running you. But we were almost there. <sighs> two more weeks, two more blocks of uranium, and it would have been German physics that achieved the world's first self-sustaining chain reaction. Except that Fermi had already done it in Chicago two years earlier. But we didn't know that. You didn't know anything. Parents said there wasn't even anything to protect you all from the radiation. We didn't have time to think about it. So if it had gone critical? You'd have all died of radiation sickness. My dear Heisenberg. My dear boy. Yes, but... By then, the reactor would have been running. I should have been there to look after you. That's all we could think about at the time, to get the reactor running, to get the reactor running. You always needed me there to slow you down a little. If I died then, what should I have missed? 30 years of attempting to explain, 30 years of reproach and hostility. Even you turned your back on me. Look at him, he's lost. He's like a lost child. So, Heisenberg, why did you come to Copenhagen in 1941? It was right that you told us about all the fears you had. But you didn't really think that I'd tell you whether the Americans were working on a bomb. No. 
You didn't seriously hope that I'd stop them? No. You were going back to work on that reactor, whatever I said? Yes. So, Heisenberg, why did you come? Why did I come? Tell us once again, another draft of the paper, and this time we shall get it right. This time we shall understand. You might even understand yourself. Why did I come? And once again, I go through that evening in 1941. I crunch over the familiar gravel and tug at the familiar bell pull. What's in my head? Fear, certainly. And the absurd and horrible importance of someone bearing bad news. But yes, something else as well. Here it comes again. I can almost see its face, something good, something bright and eager and hopeful. I open the door. And there he is. I see his eyes light up at the sight of me. He's smiling, his wary schoolboy smile. And I feel a moment of such consolation. A flash of such pure gladness. As if I'd come home after a long journey. As if a long lost child had appeared on the doorstep. Look at them, father and son still. Just for a moment. For a moment, yes, it's the twenties again. And we shall speak to each other and understand each other in the way we did before. My dear Heisenberg. My dear Bo. Come in, come in. It was the very beginning of spring. The first time I came to Copenhagen, 1924 March. Raw, blustery northern weather. But every now and then, the sun would come out and leave that first marvelous warmth of the year on your skin, that first breath of returning life. What did we do? Put on our boots and rucksacks. Took the tram to the end of the line. Start walking. Northwards to Elsinore. If you walk, you talk. Walking, talking for 100 miles. After which we talked more or less non-stop for the next three years. Oh, those years, those amazing years. Those three short years. From 1924 to 1927. From when I arrived in Copenhagen to work with you. To when you departed to take up your chair in Leipzig. Three years of raw, bracing northern springtime. At the end of which we had quantum mechanics, we had uncertainty. We had complementarity. We had the whole Copenhagen interpretation. Europe in all its glory again. A new enlightenment, with Germany back in its rightful place at the heart of it. And who led the way for everyone else? You and Niels. Well, we did. We did. And that's what you're trying to get back. Just something we did in those three years. Something we thought. I keep, I keep almost seeing it out of the corner of my eye while we're talking. Something in the way we work. Something in the way we did all those things. Together. Together, yes, together. No. No? What do you mean, no? Not together. You didn't do any of those things together. Yes, we did. Of course we did. No, no, you didn't. Every single one of them you did when you were apart. You first worked out quantum mechanics on Helgeland. I remember the evening when the mathematics first began to chime with the principle. On Helgeland. On Helgeland. On your own. On my own. And I was happy. Happier than when you came back to us all in Copenhagen the following winter. With all that Schrodinger nonsense. Nonsense? Come, come. Schrodinger's wave formulation. Yes, and suddenly everyone turned their backs on your wonderful new matrix mechanics. They couldn't understand it. Yeah, and they could understand Schrodinger's wave mechanics. Because they'd learned it in school. Yeah, well, you described it as repulsive. Schrodinger said my mathematics were repulsive. And they simply thought you were jealous. You'd gone mad by this time. You'd become fanatical. You were refusing to allow wave theory any place in quantum mechanics at all. You'd completely turned your coat. I said that wave mechanics and matrix mechanics were simply alternative tools. 
something you're always accusing me of. If it works, it works. Never mind what it means. Of course I mind what it means. What it means in language. In plain language, yes. What something means is what it means in mathematics. You think so long as the mathematics works out, the sense doesn't matter. Sense is mathematics. That's what sense is. Yes, you are far better apart, you two. You actually love the paradoxes. I mean, that's your problem. You revel in the contradiction. Yes, and you've never been able to understand the suggestiveness of paradox and contradiction. That's your problem. Having him out of town was as liberating as getting away from my hay fever in Helgoland. I actually started to think at last. I wouldn't let you even sit anywhere near each other if I were the teacher. And that's when I did. That's when I did uncertainty. Walking around Fellow Park at night on my own. Ugh! It's very late, and as soon as I've turned off into the park, I'm completely alone in the darkness. I start to think about what you'd see if you could train a telescope on me from the mountains of Norway. You'd see me by the street lamps on the Blydemsvai. Then nothing, as I vanished into the darkness. Then another glimpse of me as I passed the lamppost in front of the bandstand. Then nothing again. And that's what we see in the cloud chamber. Not a continuous track, but a series of glimpses, a series of collisions between the passing electron and various molecules of water vapor. I don't know why we hadn't thought of it before, except that we were too busy arguing to think at all. You seem to have given up on all forms of discussion. By the time I get back from Norway, I find you've done a draft of your uncertainty paper and you've already sent it for publication. And an even worse battle begins. My dear good Heisenberg, it was not open behavior to rush a first draft into print before we've discussed it together. It was not the way we worked. No, the way we worked was that you hounded me from first thing in the morning till last thing at night. The way we worked is you drove me mad. Yes, because the paper contained a fundamental error. Here we go again. I show him one of the strangest truths about the universe that any of us have stumbled across since relativity, that you can never know everything about the whereabouts of a particle or anything else, even bore now as he prowls up and down the room in that maddening way of his, because we can't observe it without introducing some new element into the situation, a molecule of water vapor for it to hit, a piece of light, Things which have an energy of their own, which therefore have an effect on that they hit. I shatter the objective universe around you, and all you can say is, there's an error in the formulation. There was! Listen, in my paper, what we were trying to locate is not a free electron off on its travels through a cloud chamber, but an electron, when it's at home, moving around inside an atom. And the uncertainty arises, not as you claim, through its indeterminate recoil when it's hit by an incoming photon. Plain language, plain language. This is plain language. Listen. The language of classical mechanics. Listen, Copenhagen is an atom. Margareta is its nucleus. It's about the right scale, 10,000 to 1. Yes, yes. Now, Bohr is an electron. He is wandering about the city, somewhere in the darkness. No one knows where. He's here. He's there. He's everywhere and nowhere. Up at Fellow Park. Down at New Carlsberg. Passing City Hall. Out by the harbour. I am a photon. A quantum of light. I have been dispatched into the darkness to find Bohr. And I succeed. Why? Because I've managed to collide with him. But look, what's happened? He's slowed down. He's been deflected. He's no longer doing exactly what he was so maddeningly doing when I walked into him. But Heisenberg, Heisenberg, you also have been deflected. If people can see what's happened to you, to their piece of light, then they can work out what must have happened to me. The trouble is knowing what's happened to you. three years, Heisenberg. Not to exaggerate, but we turned the world inside out. Yes, listen. Now it comes. 
comes, not comes. We put man back at the center of the universe. Throughout history, we keep finding ourselves displaced. We keep exiling ourselves to the periphery of things. First, we turn ourselves into a mere adjunct of God's unknowable purposes. Tiny figures kneeling in the great cathedral of creation. And no sooner have we recovered ourselves in the Renaissance, no sooner has man become, as Protagoras proclaimed him, the measure of all things, then we're pushed aside again by the products of our own reasoning. We are dwarfed again as physicists build the great new cathedrals for us to wonder at. The laws of classical mechanics that exist whether we exist or not. And then we come to the beginning of the 20th century and we're suddenly forced to rise from our knees again. It starts with Einstein. It starts with Einstein. He shows that measurement, measurement on which the whole possibility of science depends, measurement is not an impersonal event that occurs with impartial universality. It's a human act carried out from a specific point of view in time and space from the one particular viewpoint of a possible observer. And then, here in Copenhagen, in the mid-twenties, we discover that there is no precisely determinable objective universe. That the universe exists only as a series of approximations, only within the limits determined by our relationship with it. Only through the understanding lodged inside the human head. If it's Heisenberg at the center of the universe, then the one bit of the universe he can't see, it's Heisenberg. Forgive me, but you don't even know why you did uncertainty in the first place, and I'm sorry. But you want to make everything seem so heroically abstract and logical. I look around me and what I see isn't a story. I see confusion and rage and tears and jealousy and no one knowing what things mean or which way they're going to go. All the same, it works. It works. Oh, yes, it works. It works wonderfully. Within three months of publishing your uncertainty paper, you're offered a chair at Leipzig. I didn't mean that. And if you want to know why you've come here to Copenhagen, I'll tell you that as well. You're right, there's no great mystery about it. You've come to show yourself off to us. Margrethe. When he first came in 1924, he was a humble assistant lecturer from a humiliated nation, grateful to have a job. Now he's here, back in triumph. The leading scientist in a nation that's conquered most of Europe. He's come to show us how well he's done in life. This is so unlike you. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but isn't that really why he's here? because he's burning to let us know that he's in charge of some vital piece of secret research. And that even so, he's preserved a lofty moral independence. Preserved it so famously that he's being watched by the Gestapo. Preserved it so successfully that he's now also got a wonderfully important moral dilemma to face. Yes, well, now you're simply working yourself up. A chain reaction. You tell one painful truth and it leads to two more. And as you frankly admit, you're going back to continue doing precisely what you were doing before whatever Niels tells you. 
Yes. Because you wouldn't dream of giving up such a wonderful opportunity for research. Not if I can possibly help it. Also, you want to demonstrate to the Nazis how useful theoretical physics can be. You want to save the honor of German science. You want to be there to re-establish it in all its glory as soon as the war is over. All the same, I won't tell Speer that the reactor... Will produce plutonium? No. Because you're afraid of what will happen if the Nazis commit huge resources and you fail to deliver the bombs. Please, don't try and tell us that you're a hero of the resistance. I never said I was a hero. Your talent is for skiing too fast for anyone to see where you are. For always being in more than one position at a time. Like one of your particles. I can only say that it worked. Unlike most of the gestures made by the heroes of the Resistance, it worked. Oh, I know what you're thinking. I should have joined the plot against Hitler. Got myself hanged like the others. Of course not. You don't say it because there are things that can't be said, but you think it. No. What would it have achieved? Really, it is ridiculous. You reason your way, both of you, with astonishing delicacy and precision into the tiny world of the atom. And now it turns out that everything depends on these really rather large objects on your shoulders. And what's going on there is... Elsinore. Elsinore. Yes. And maybe you're right. I was afraid of what might happen. I was conscious of being on the winning side. Why didn't you kill me? Why didn't I kill me? That night in 1941. My dear Heisenberg, the suggestion is, of course... Most interesting. So interesting, in fact, it didn't even occur to you. Complementarity, once again. I, I'm your enemy. I'm also your friend. I'm... A danger to mankind, I'm also your guest. I'm a particle, I'm also a wave. We have one set of obligations to the world in general and other sets never to be reconciled to our fellow countrymen, to our neighbors, to our family, to our friends, to our children. All we can do is look afterwards and see what happened. I'll tell you another reason why you did uncertainty. You have a natural affinity for it. Well, I must have cut a gratifyingly chastened figure when I returned in 1947, crawling on my hands and knees, my nation back in ruin. Oh, really? Once more, you demonstrated how you personally came out on top. Enough, my love, enough. No. I've kept my thoughts to myself for all these years, but it's so maddening having this clever son forever dancing about in front of one's eyes, forever demanding our approval, forever struggling to shock us, forever begging to be told what the limits to his freedom are, if only so he can go out to transgress. I'm sorry, but really, on your hands and knees, it was my good dear, kind husband who was on his hands and knees, literally, crawling down to the beach in the darkness in 1943. Fleeing like a thief in the night from his homeland to escape being murdered. I warned you in 1941, but you wouldn't listen. At least Borg got across to Sweden. <laughs> and where were you? I can only say I didn't do it. I didn't build the bomb. No. And why didn't you? I'll tell you that as well. Because you couldn't. You didn't understand the physics. I understood very clearly. I simply didn't tell the others. Ah. Oh. I understood, though. But secretly. You can look it up if you don't believe me. There's evidence for once. It was all most carefully recorded. Witnesses, even. Unimpeachable witnesses. Who wrote it down. Who recorded it and transcribed it. 
Even though you didn't tell anyone? I told one person. I told Otto Hahn. That terrible night after we heard the news of Hiroshima, somewhere in the small hours, I gave him a reasonably good account of how the bomb had worked. After the event? After the event, yes! When it didn't matter anymore. The critical mass. That was the most important thing. The amount of material you needed to establish the chain reaction. Did you tell him the critical mass? I gave him a figure, yes. You can look it up. We were all rounded up by the British. The whole team, everyone who worked on atomic science, and we were spirited away to Farm Hall in Huntingtonshire. Pan asked me when we first arrived whether I thought there were any hidden microphones. I laughed. I said the British were far too old-fashioned to, to know any Gestapo methods. I underestimated them. There were microphones everywhere. They recorded everything, so look it up. But the critical mass. You gave him a figure. What was the figure you gave him? I forget. Heisenberg. It's all on record. You can, you can see for yourself. The figure for the Hiroshima bomb was... 50 kilograms. So that was the figure you gave Hahn? 50 kilograms? I said about a ton. About a ton. Thousand kilograms. Heisenberg, I believe I am at last beginning to understand something. One thing I was wrong about. You were 20 times over. The one thing. But Heisenberg, your mathematics. Your mathematics, how could they have been so far out? They weren't. As soon as I calculated the diffusion, I got it just about right. As soon as you calculated it? I gave everybody a seminar on it a week later. It's in the record. Look it up. You mean you hadn't calculated it before? There was no need. It had already been done. For natural uranium, you needed to calculate the figure for pure 235. Obviously. And you didn't? I didn't. Organizing in Copenhagen about plutonium was beside the point. You could have done it without ever building the reactor. You could have done it with 235 all the time. Almost certainly not. Just possibly, though. Just possibly. And that question was settled long before you arrived in Copenhagen simply by failing to try the diffusion equation. Such a tiny failure. But the consequences kept branching out over the years, doubling and redoubling. Until they were large enough to save a city. Which city? Any of the cities that we never dropped our bomb on. London, presumably, if you'd had it in time. If the Americans had already entered the war and the Allies had begun to liberate Europe, then... Who knows? Paris as well. Amsterdam. Perhaps Copenhagen. So, Heisenberg, tell us this one simple thing. Why didn't you do the calculation? I don't know why I didn't do it. Because I never thought of it. Because it, it didn't occur to me. Because I assumed it wasn't worth doing. Assumed? Assumed? You never assumed anything. That's how you got uncertainty because you rejected our assumptions. 
You calculated, Heisenberg, you calculated everything. The first thing you did with the problem was the mathematics. You should have been there to slow me down. Yes. You wouldn't have got away with it if I'd been standing over you. Though, in fact, you made exactly the same assumption. You thought there was no danger for exactly the same reasons as I did. Why didn't you calculate it? Why didn't I calculate it? Tell us why you didn't calculate it, and we'll know why I didn't. It's obvious why I didn't. Well, go on. Because he wasn't trying to build a bomb. Yes, thank you. Because he wasn't trying to build a bomb. I imagine it was the same for me, because I wasn't trying to build a bomb. Thank you. So you bluffed yourself, like I did, at poker with the straight I never had. But in that case... Why did I come to Copenhagen? Yes. Why did I come? One more draft, yes. One final draft. And once again, I crunch over the familiar gravel to the boar's front door and tug at the familiar bell pull. Why have I come? I know perfectly well. I know so well that I've no need to ask myself. Until once again, the heavy front door opens. He stands on the doorstep. Until this instant, his thoughts have been everywhere and nowhere, like unobserved particles through all the slits in the diffraction grating simultaneously. Now they have to be observed and specified. My dear Heisenberg. My dear Bohr. And at once, the clear purposes inside my head lose all definite shape. The light falls on them, and they scatter. How difficult it is to see even what's in front of one's eyes. All we possess is the present, and the present endlessly dissolves into the past. Bohr has gone, even as I turn to see Margareta. Niels is right. You look older. I believe you had some personal trouble. Margareta slips into history, even as I turn back to Bohr. And yet, how much more difficult still it is to catch the slightest glimpse of what's behind one's eyes. Here I am at the center of the universe, and yet all I can see are two smiles that don't belong to me. Elizabeth, the children? Oh, very well, they... They send their love, of course. I can feel a third smile in the room, very close to me. Could it be the one I suddenly see for a moment in the mirror there? And is the awkward stranger wearing it in any way connected with this presence that I can feel in the room? This all-enveloping, unobserved presence? I watched the two smiles in the room. One awkward and ingratiating. The other rapidly fading from incautious warmth to bare politeness. There's also a third smile in the room, I know. Unchangingly courteous, I hope. And unchangingly guarded. You've managed to get some skiing. I glance at Margreda, and for a moment I see what she can see and I can't. Myself, and the smile vanishing from my face as poor Heisenberg blunders on. I look at the two of them looking at me, and for a moment I see the third person in the room as clearly as I see them, their importunate guest, stumbling from one crass and unwelcome thoughtlessness to the next. I look at him, looking at me, anxiously, pleadingly, urging me back to the old days, and I see what he sees. And yes, now it comes, now it comes. There's someone missing from the room. He sees me, he sees Margreda. He doesn't see himself. You suggested a stroll. We shan't be long. A week at most. What? A great hike through Zealand. You remember Elsinore? The darkness inside the human soul. And out we go, out under the autumn trees. Now there's no one in the world except Bohr and the invisible other. Who is he, this all-enveloping presence in the darkness? The flying particle wanders the darkness. No one knows where. It's here, it's there, it's everywhere. 
and nowhere. With careful casualness, he begins to ask the question he's prepared. Does one, as a physicist, have the moral right to work on the practical exploitation of atomic energy? The Great Collision. I stop, he stops. This is how they work. He gazes at me, horrified. Now at last he knows where he is and what he's doing. And even as the moment of collision begins, it's over. He turns away. Already I'm hurrying back towards the house. Already they're both flying away from each other into the darkness again. Our conversation's over. Our great partnership. All our friendship. And everything about him becomes as uncertain as it was before. Unless... Yes, a thought experiment. Let's suppose for a moment I don't go flying off into the night. Let's see what happens if instead I remember the paternal role I'm supposed to play. If I stop and control my anger, and turn back to you and ask you, why? Why? Why are you confident it's going to be so reassuringly difficult to build a bomb with 235? Is it because you've done the calculation? The calculation? Of the diffusion in 235. No. It's because you haven't calculated it. You haven't considered calculating it. You haven't consciously realized there was a calculation to be made. And of course, now I have realized. In fact, it wouldn't be all that difficult. Let's see. The scattering cross section is about six times 10 to 24, so the mean free path would be. Hold on. And suddenly, a very different and very terrible new world begins to take shape. was the last and greatest demand that Heisenberg made on his friendship with you. To be understood when he couldn't understand himself. And that was the last and greatest act of friendship for Heisenberg that you performed in return. To leave him misunderstood. Yes. Perhaps I should thank you. Perhaps you should. Anyway, it was the end of the story. Though perhaps there was also something I should thank you for. That summer night in 1943, when I escaped across the Sound in the fishing boat and the German freighters arrived. What's that to do with Heisenberg? When the ships arrived on the Wednesday, there were 8,000 Jews in Denmark to be arrested and crammed into their holds. The following day, on the eve of the Jewish New Year, when the SS began their roundup, there was scarcely a Jew to be found. For a handful of us in one fishing smack to get past the German patrol boats was remarkable enough. For a whole armada to get past with the best part of 8,000 people on board was like the Red Sea parting. So perhaps I should thank you. For what? My life. 
all our lives. Nothing to do with me by that time. I regret to say. But after I'd gone, you came back to Copenhagen. To make sure our people didn't take it over the Institute in your absence. I never thanked you for that either. Cyclotron. You could have separated a little two, three, five of it. Meanwhile, you were going on from Sweden to Los Alamos. To play my small but helpful part in the deaths of a hundred thousand people. Niels, you did nothing wrong. Didn't I? Of course not. You were a good man from first to last. And no one could ever say otherwise. Whereas I. Whereas you, my dear Heisenberg, never managed to contribute to the death of one single solitary person in all your life. Before we can lay our hands on anything, our life's over. Before we can glimpse who or what we are, we're gone and laid to dust. Settled among all the dust we raised. And sooner or later, there will come a time when all our children are laid to dust, and all our children's children. When no more decisions, great or small, are ever made again. When there's no more uncertainty, because there's no more knowledge. And when all our eyes are closed, when even the ghosts have gone, what will be left of our beloved world? Our ruined and dishonored and beloved world. But in the meanwhile, in this most precious meanwhile, there it is. The trees in Fellow Park, our children and our children's children, preserved just possibly by that one short moment in Copenhagen, by some event that will never quite be located or defined, by that final core of uncertainty at the heart of things. Go behind the scenes of Copenhagen and explore the process of bringing an award-winning play to television. Visit PBS online at pbs.org. To order Copenhagen on home video, call Video Finders at 1-800-343-4727. PBS Hollywood Presents was made possible by the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to enhance public understanding of science and technology. The foundation also seeks to portray the lives of men and women engaged in scientific and technological pursuit. The Amundsen Foundation, committed to the creative pursuit of quality in the arts. Michael J. Connell Foundation, Lovelace Family Trust, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, and by contributions to your PBS station from viewers like you. Thank you. This is PBS. This play isn't an attempt to come to any final judgment of Heisenberg. He was in a very, very difficult situation as a physicist in a totalitarian country. Heisenberg didn't present himself as a hero. Um, he undoubtedly did make compromises with the Nazi regime. 
and I'm sure he made them for mixed motives, some of them which I think were undoubtedly honourable. And I'm very taken aback by people living now um, who had no experience of living in Nazi Germany um, who rush to judgment on Heisenberg. for piano from Mozart in A major, played by my father, the first movement. My father felt first to be a son to all this uh, <laughs> wise teacher. Maybe he was too confident in a naive way when he went there. He didn't consider the situation that Denmark was invaded by the Germans and uh, of course uh, that even uh, Bohr was a Jewish man and Bohr was in a completely different situation. I don't know exactly what what really happened between them. I think he he felt very much that he had lost a friend. It was an occupied country, and here comes a person from you, the occupier. And I think that was very naive of Heisenberg, to think that they could just talk like old friends under those circumstances. I think he, he was, there was some psychological deficiency that he wasn't aware of how Bohr would feel when, when he came, as a, at least formally, as a representative of the occupier. Various people have speculated that um, Heisenberg was trying to find out about the Allied atomic program, indeed that he was sent by the German government, and I think that's quite possible. What I cannot believe is that anyone in the German government ever authorized Heisenberg to go to Copenhagen and say to Niels Bohr, who was known to be in touch with Western scientists, to say to him that there was this highly secret program running in Germany to produce atomic weapons. That Heisenberg must have done off his own bat. And to me, it suggests that at the very least that he hoped that Bohr would pass on the news to the Allies that there was an atomic bomb program in Germany. And I think it just possibly gives some color to Heisenberg's own account of the meeting, his own explanation of the meeting, that he hoped that Bohr would persuade uh, allied scientists to be as discouraging to their governments about nuclear weapons as the German physicists were being to the German government. Now, of course, I knew that Bohr was a Dane and Denmark was occupied by German troops, so it was obvious that Bohr would have very strong feelings in this matter. At the same time, I felt that Bohr and I were good friends and he knew my attitude to problems of this kind from earlier years. So I felt that still uh, this would, would be a good basis for uh, confidence and for uh, conversation on this problem. Everyone since the war has had suspicions about Werner Heisenberg. Uh, I have to say, as a young man, he was thought to be very straightforward and, uh, and very open and very charming man, and everyone liked him. But he certainly seems to have changed during the Nazi period. He does seem to have become much more closed up as life went on. And he certainly felt he had been misunderstood. Um, I think not surprisingly, he was much attacked after the Second World War. And people still have uh, passionately vituperative feelings about him. In fact, my greater Niels Bohr's wife was particularly angry about all his attempts to, uh, to exculpate himself. Margrethe was offended by his coming in 1941 and afterwards said, whatever anyone says about that meeting, it was a hostile one. When I wrote the play, Heisenberg had uh, commented publicly on the meeting and said what he thought had happened, but Niels Bohr hadn't. What I didn't know was that Bohr had 
written an account of the meeting in a very angry letter to Heisenberg, long after the war, in which he put his version of the meeting. However, absolutely characteristically, he didn't send the letter. He started to redraft it. He was trying uh, to dissent very strongly from Heisenberg without hurting Heisenberg's feelings, but he was a very kindly man. And he never sent the letter. He went on redrafting it until he died. His family found all these drafts of the letter among his papers and decided not to publish them, but to uh, put them in the Niels Bohr archive in Copenhagen and to embargo them until 50 years after his death. One of the ideas that Heisenberg and Bohr introduced into physics is that the act of observation affects what you are observing. And curiously, the production of the play has had a somewhat similar effect on the subject. It has persuaded the Bohr family to release the letter and indeed all the various drafts of the letter early. I think that I owe it to you to tell you that I am greatly amazed to see how much your memory has deceived you. You spoke in a manner that could only give me the firm impression that under your leadership, everything was being done in Germany to develop atomic weapons. A great matter for mankind was at issue, in which, despite our personal friendship, we had to be regarded as representatives of two sides engaged in mortal combat. Bohr certainly seemed angrier than I have made him seem in the play, and he certainly claims to remember the bead meeting better than I've um, made him. And I very much wish I'd had the letter when I wrote the play. I think uh, the fact that Bohr did not send the letter to my father was a, a much more difficult situation to deal with than if he had sent it. In some way, I think my father would have welcomed a response. And uh, in any relationship, I think it is extremely important to talk about situations, even unpleasant ones. The fact uh, that that did not take place, I think, uh, made him in some way hurt and uh, indicated that there was a loss in trust in the relationship. It is imaginable that there is some evidence somewhere that um, would put beyond doubt what occurred at the meeting. But that still wouldn't put beyond doubt what Niels Bohr thought Heisenberg's intentions were and what Heisenberg thought Niels Bohr had understood of the meeting, that would be just as elusive as ever. Heisenberg died in a very biblical way. He was at home. He asked some of his closest friends to his deathbed. He said, look, I'm dying and I'm very sad that I did not have this last talk with Niels Bohr. Yeah? So I knew when he said that on his deathbed that this um, cast a very dark shadow on his life. And I felt that whenever this comes up, it was a friendship which was very important for him, you know, which was destroyed by this. There's something something very sad about these two men as they got older in life, um, each of them separately going through that meeting over and over again, trying to see what had fractured their friendship, trying to actually get precisely right what had occurred at that, uh, at that fatal meeting. At least in my play, their ghosts get together to talk about it. This play is about the difficulty of knowing why people do what they do. It's also about the difficulty of knowing why one does what one does oneself. And in the end, it comes to the conclusion that in order to understand ourselves, we have to talk to other people. We have to see our ideas reflected in other people. And that 
is what Copenhagen is about.